Hello, and welcome to your second convolutional neural networks lecture. In the last lecture, we talked a lot about the details of a convolutional architecture. In summary, convolutional architectures allow us to basically learn filters or kernels that we can slide across our images in order to learn useful features. We then typically downsample these features to get a more compressed version of our image and then repeat the process. Through this process of convolution, pool, convolution, pool, we learn a useful set of features that can then be flattened and fed into something like a feedforward neural network in order to do things like classify images as hot dog or not hot dog. Today we're going to talk about some more advanced techniques related to convolutional neural networks. Now one thing we briefly touched on in the last lecture is that convolutional nets have a ton of different parameters and we don't always have enough data in order to train them. Labeled images that are labeled in the exact way that you want for whatever image task you want to do are sometimes hard to find. This can lead to overfitting in our neural network. One method of regularizing our models that is specific to convolutional nets is data augmentation. When we don't have a lot of data, one thing we can do is feed slightly transformed versions of all of our images into our neural network. For instance, if we have this original image of a cat, every time we send that through our neural network during training, we can feed it a slightly altered version by shifting or rotating or making other transformations. We want our neural network to be able to recognize that this is still a cat no matter how we've transformed it. So by training with these slightly augmented images, it allows our network to learn that this is a cat no matter what small changes we make. There's many ways that we can tweak our images. For instance, we could take the image and crop a little bit or flip it or translate it or rotate it or zoom or adjust the contrast or the brightness. On the right hand side you can see a bunch of augmentations of the same dog photo that have been cropped or flipped or zoomed or otherwise transformed. By making these small changes every time we send this image through the neural network during training we can basically teach it that this is still the same dog no matter what small changes we make to it. Thus this is regularizing our model because it forces it to learn that images that are slightly changed are still really the same thing. Another issue that convolutional nets can have, especially as they get deeper and deeper, is something called the vanishing gradient problem. You can think of neural networks as just functions of functions of functions. Basically, our neural networks are taking our input and applying a function to it, and then applying another function to that output, and another function to that output, and another function to that output. One thing that can happen when we're feeding our information through multiple, multiple transformations is that noise can be added at each level of this transformation. If our neural network is incredibly deep, this noise can overwhelm the gradient, and basically our neural network is not able to learn what the parameters of the network should be. Your textbook likens this to the game Telephone, where you whisper something to someone who whispers what they think they heard to the next person, and so on and so forth. As you go through such a long chain of people, you're message eventually gets kind of scrambled and it doesn't really sound anything like what you had in the beginning. And this is a big problem because deeper networks allow us to learn more complex relationships between our inputs and our outputs, but if we have them too deep, we're not always able to learn efficiently. And this is a big problem because deep networks allow us to learn more complex relationships between inputs and outputs, which often perform better. However, as we add a lot of depth to these neural networks, we can run into problems like the vanishing gradient problem, and we're not really able to learn what our parameters should be. Be. So we're always looking for ways to be able to increase the depth of our neural network while avoiding problems like the vanishing gradient problem. One way to do that is with something called a residual connection. The idea behind a residual connection is we basically take our input and first feed it through a typical type of layer, like maybe we're applying some convolution. Then we also take a copy of that input and add it unaltered to the output of that other pathway. So again, what we're doing is we're taking that data and we're we're feeding it through our typical process, but we're also taking an unaltered copy and adding it at the end. This preserves the signal in our original data, allowing us to build deeper and deeper layers without that vanishing gradient problem. Now, one thing I want to note is that residual connections were widely popularized by a model called ResNet back in 2015. ResNet essentially allowed people to build deeper and deeper convolutional networks and thus have better performance. 
and ResNet allowed people to build deeper and deeper models, much deeper than other models beforehand. However, there is some argument about what part of ResNet really helped address this vanishing gradient problem, because in addition to introducing residual connections, ResNet also has things like ReLU activations and batch normalization, all of which prevent the vanishing gradient issue. As a lot of people say, deep learning currently is more of an art than a science. So there's a lot of things that we've tested and we know they work, but we don't exactly know how. What we do know is that adding residual connections to our neural networks allows us to build deeper architectures. As I mentioned in our last section, a lot of the convolutional neural networks use something called batch normalization. Because we went over this in the feed forward neural network section, I won't dwell on it too much here. But remember, the purpose of batch normalization is to take the outputs of some layer and normalize them in some way. Just like with the residual connections, adding batch normalization allows us to build deeper and deeper networks. Next, let's talk about depthwise separable convolutions. Now, one thing we talked about in the previous lecture is that convolutions are pretty expensive operations. There's a lot of parameters to learn and a lot of calculations that are happening as we take our filter and we slide it across our image. This picture on the screen represents a typical convolution. For each convolution, we have a filter that is dk by dk, where dk is just the height and width of that filter. Each of our filters also has to have a depth of m because it needs to apply to all m channels in our image, for instance, 3 for our RGB image. In a typical convolution, we take that filter, we slide it across our image to get our output. dp is the number of places that the filter can land, and n is the number of filters that are applied. So when we have n dk by dk filters, we end up with an output of size dp by dp by n. But what if I told you there was a way to get a very similar output, but with much fewer mathematical operations and with fewer learnable parameters? In other words, in typical convolutions, we have filters that have the same depth as the input image. But what if I told you there was a way to get a very similar output, but have fewer mathematical operations and fewer learnable parameters, thus making our network a lot faster? That is what depthwise separable convolutions attempt to do. In depthwise separable convolutions, we basically make the assumption that each channel of our image is independent. And thus, instead of having filters that are dk by dk by m, where the depth m represents the number of channels in our image, we learn individually filters that are only one dimensional. They are dk high, dk wide, but only one layer deep. This is the depthwise portion of depthwise separable convolution. We apply one of these filters to each of our channels individually. So for instance, in an RGB image, we would apply one filter to the red layer, one to the blue, and one to the green. This will leave us with an output that is dp by dp by m dp by dp is again the number of places the filter can land, and m is the number of channels, also the number of filters that we've so far applied to our image. So remember, we have m filters, one per channel in our input, and for each of those inputs, we just slide it over that individual channel. However, this output that we've created is not the size that we want it to be, so we have a second convolutional step, the pointwise convolution. For the pointwise convolution, we take these one by one filters that are m deep and we apply them to the output of our previous convolution. These basically take the information that is separate for all of the layers in the previous convolution and combine them together. We'll have n of these one by one by m filters and we'll apply each of these filters to the output that we created in the last step. The resulting output will still be dp by dp, but now it will have depth n for the number of filters that we learned in this pointwise portion. But as you can see that through the combination of these two convolutions, we get an output that is the same size as a just typical convolution. Now, we are making some assumptions when we do a depthwise separable convolution. We're assuming that the information from each of our individual m channels in the input is independent and that we can apply our filters independently and then just combine them in the second step. In other words, unlike a typical convolution where our filter has depth m for the number of channels, in a depthwise separable convolution, our filters are dk by dk, but only have a depth of 1. We apply one filter to each of our channels individually. 
and then we convolve that output in order to compress it and get the output shape that we would like. We then learn these one by one by M filters that allow us to combine that information in different ways and get our DP by DP by N output. But that was a lot to take in. So let's look at this process a little more closely. So here we have a comparison of typical convolutions kind of blurred out on the left and a depthwise separable convolution on the right. In a typical convolution, you can see that our filters have a depth of three. So when we place them on top of our image, there is one weight per pixel that we've landed on top of. We take all of the weights from the filters, multiply them by all the pixels from our image, and we add them together, getting us our output value. In a depthwise separable convolution, however, our filters only have a depth of one, and we only apply them to one channel at a time. So for instance, here, we're taking this filter and we're only applying it to the blue channel. Just like normal, we slide this filter across our blue channel to get an output. However, because we only applied it to the blue channel instead of like in a normal convolution where we apply it to all of the channels at once, we actually have to repeat this process with a new filter for each channel. However, now our resulting output is too big. Thus, we move to the pointwise convolutional portion of our depthwise separable convolution. Now, for a typical convolution, we're already done. We've applied our filter to all of our image. However, for a depthwise separable convolution, we now need to learn these one by one by M filters that are going to take the output that we just generated, one per channel, and basically compress it into the output size that we want. For instance, this is what the pointwise convolution filter looks like. It's one by one and has a depth of M, which in this case is three. We take this filter and we apply it to the output of our depthwise convolution. This will take all three pixels that it landed on top of and combine them in some way. We then slide this filter across the entire output to get our final output. Notice that this output after we do both of our steps is the same size as the output from a convolutional filter. Thus, we're getting a very similar output first by doing a depthwise convolution where we apply a filter to each of our channels and then applying a pointwise convolution where we take a filter that's one by one by M that combines the information from the output of each of those channels to get our final output. Now, you might ask, why on earth would we bother doing that? That seems kind of complicated. Well, the reason is that it's actually more efficient both in terms of the number of floating point operations, like multiplications that we need to do, and in terms of the number of parameters that we need to learn. Starting with a typical convolution, let's count the number of multiplications that we'll need to do. For each filter in a typical convolution, we'll have dk, the height or width of the filter, squared times m multiplications happening. That's because our filters have dk by dk by m parameters in them. When that filter lands on our image, we'll have to multiply each of those parameters by the pixel values that it lands on top of. And that's only for one placement of the filter, so we then have to multiply that value by dp squared. This is the number of places that our filter can land on our input image. And of course, we have to repeat this once per filter that we learn, because remember, we can apply multiple filters to the same input. Thus, moving all these variables around, we get n times dk squared squared times m times dp squared as the number of multiplications that need to happen in order to do that convolutional layer. Now let's look at the number of multiplications needed for a depthwise separable convolution. Remember, depthwise separable convolutions happen in two steps. In the first step, we have these one-dimensional filters, so they're dk by dk by one. That means for each of these filters, they are dk squared number of multiplications that need to happen any time that filter lands somewhere. And we apply one filter per channel of our original input, thus we need to multiply that dk squared by m. And together, this is just the number of multiplications that need to happen for each position that the filter could land. Thus, we need to multiply this value by dp squared once per place that this filter could possibly land. And that's only the first step. 
Next, we need to think about the pointwise convolution. For the pointwise convolution, our filters are actually pretty simple. They're one by one by m. So every time we apply one of these filters, we are going to do m multiplications. However, we have n of these filters. So, so far we have m by n multiplications that need to happen m for each filter times n the number of filters. And finally, we need to think about the fact that these filters can land in dp by dp locations in that input. Thus, for our pointwise convolutions, we have m times n times dp squared multiplications happening. Adding the number of multiplications from those two steps together and simplifying, we get this formula. This tells us that if we apply a depthwise separable convolution layer, we will do n plus dk squared times m times dp squared multiplications. So let's compare these. Now, both of these formulas have the m times dp squared in them, but in depthwise separable convolutions, we only multiply that term by n plus dk squared. For regular convolutions, we multiply it by n times dk squared. Thus, we can see that typical convolutions have a lot more multiplications that are happening, and more multiplications means slower computation. We can actually calculate the ratio of the number of multiplications by taking the number of multiplications for the depthwise separable convolution and dividing it by the number of multiplications for a typical convolution. When you apply the math, you get 1 over n, which is the number of filters we're going to apply, plus 1 over dk squared. DK, remember, is just the filter size, like a 3x3 three three filter. And if you plug in some numbers, you can see very clearly that the number of multiplications required for a depthwise separable convolution is much lower than for a normal one. But that's not all. It's not only more efficient in terms of the number of multiplications happening, but also in terms of the number of parameters that your model needs to learn. For a typical convolutional filter, we have DK by DK by M. That means that the filter is going to have dk squared times m parameters that it needs to learn. And of course, we don't just have one filter, we have n of them. So we need to multiply that term by n. Then, and this matters a little bit less, we have to add n parameters because we have biases for each of these values. So each convolutional layer will need to learn dk squared times m times n plus n parameters. Depthwise separable convolutions need to learn a lot fewer. In the first step of the depthwise separable convolution, our filters are only dk by dk by 1. That means that each of the filters that we learn in this step are only going to have dk squared times 1 parameters. And we learn one of these filters for each of the channels of our input, so we'll multiply that number of parameters by m. And then of course we'll add m just for the biases that we'll add to the model. In the second step of a depthwise separable convolution, we have pointwise filters. These filters are one by one by m, so we really only need to learn m parameters per filter. Multiply that by n for the number of filters that we're going to learn, and of course plus n for the number of biases. You can see if you just plug in some numbers for dk and m and n that you're going to have to learn many fewer parameters when doing a depthwise separable convolution compared to when you're doing a regular convolution. Thus, in summary, depthwise separable convolutions are not only more efficient computationally in terms of the number of multiplications that it needs to do, but also more efficient in terms of the number of parameters that your model has to learn. And it turns out that our performance is not really inhibited that much when we have depthwise separable convolutions, and thus it basically saves us a lot of time and a lot of parameters while still giving us similar performance to a typical convolution. Next, let's talk about how how we can visualize convolutional neural nets. Often when we talk about neural networks, we're concerned about the fact that they're black boxes. It's really hard to tell why the models are doing the things they're doing and making the predictions they're making. However, convolutional neural nets allow a really cool way to have interpretable AI where we can basically see why and how the model is making decisions. To do this, we basically create visualizations of the process of of the convolutional net. The first thing we can do is visualize layer activation. When we send an image through convolutional and pooling layers, the resulting output is referred to as the activation of that layer. And one thing that might be interesting to us is to see the activations of an image as we send it through our net. And visualizing layer activations is super simple. 
all we do is we take an image and we send it through our neural network and we look at the outputs after each layer. For instance, we can see this image of a cat that's been fed through our convolutional net and from this output we can see that it looks like our net is doing some sort of edge detection. And we can look at these outputs for every single layer in our convolutional net, both convolutional layers and pooling layers. One thing that's really cool to note is that because we're often using ReLU activations, you can see different features learned by the model are turned off for this particular image. In fact, it gets more and more sparse as we go deeper into the neural network. Visualizing layer activations can help you see two really cool things. First, as we just mentioned, it can help you see the sparsity as you move through the convolutional net. Remember, ConvNets learn hierarchical feature representation, so the earlier features tend to be more fine-grained, like textures or patterns, and the later features tend to be higher level, like this is a cat eye or a cat ear. The sparsity of the higher layers reflect this fact because not every feature that the net has learned is going to be present in our image. Second, we can see that abstraction. As we look at the activations of each of our layers, we can sort of see that it's seeing more high level things as we move it through the convolutional net. And activations aren't the only thing that we can visualize. We can also visualize the filters or kernels learned by our convolutional layers. In order to do this, we learn what image would maximally activate each filter. This will tell us what that filter is really attuned to detect. The way we do this is we start with a blank image and then we use gradient ascent to change the image in a way that more maximally activates that filter. After a few steps of doing that, we'll get an image that shows us what would maximally activate this filter. In other words, what is the image that this filter would respond the most to? For instance, here is the image that would really highly activate one of our earlier filters and you can see that it's basically doing some sort of like horizontal line detection and really maximally is activated in patterns that look something like fur. And because this neural network is trying to detect whether something is or is not a cat, that's probably a really useful thing to learn. Last but not least, the third way that we can visualize our convolutional neural networks is with something called GradCam. The CAM in GradCam stands for Class Activation Heat Map. GradCam allows us to see why convolutional neural nets made certain predictions. For instance, here the model is trying to predict what this image is of, and it thinks that it's of an elephant. The heat map that you see on this image is telling you what made the model think that this is a picture of elephants. Basically, it shows you where in the image is telling that network that this is an elephant. The way it does this is with two steps. First, we have to figure out how intensely our input image is activating different channels in the last layer. Remember, the last convolutional layer should be those higher level features that our conv layers are detecting. So we want to know which of those features that we learned are activated in this particular image. And this is super easy to get. All we do is we send the image through the neural network and look at the activations of the last convolutional layer. This is the last layer before we would feed all of those features into the feed forward part of the network. We'll call these values A, K, which is just a matrix of all of the different activations from that last layer. Next, we need to figure out how important each activation is with regard to our class. In other words, if a network thinks something is a cat, what features need to be present in order for it to think that that is a cat? There will be some features that are really important, some that are sort of important, and some that don't matter at all. In order to calculate how important each of these features are, we have to calculate the gradient for a specific class with respect to those activations. In other words, we need to say, how does our prediction for which class it is change when the different activations in the last convolutional layer change? These gradients 
basically calculate weights for how important each feature is in determining that it's a cat or an elephant. We then combine these together. We take the weights learned from the gradient and multiply it by the activations that we get by sending our image through our convolutional portion of the ComNet. Together, these create a heat map that tell us which pixels in our image are telling the model that this is an elephant. Thus, we create a heat map that we can superimpose on our image that tells us what this neural network was looking at when it decided that this was an elephant. For instance, here we see that it's paying particular attention to the ears and the trunks of these two elephants, which makes sense. These are things that might reasonably give the model a lot of information that these are elephants in the picture. Now, just a note, we typically compute grad cam images for the predicted class. So for instance, if we predict that something is a daisy, we would calculate the grad cam for the class daisy to see what the model thought looked like a daisy in the image. However, there's nothing stopping us from calculating grad cams for other classes. For instance, we could ask for this elephant image what in this image makes you think this image might be a dog? One place where grad cam might have been really helpful is in that classic example we talked about in 392. In this example, we were trying to build a model that determined whether something was a husky or a wolf. Now, as you may remember, what happened is the model learned to detect snow because the training images of wolves tended to have snow in them where the training images of huskies tended to not have snow. Grad cam would have been useful in this situation because it would have told us what parts of the image were telling us that something is a wolf and we would have seen really high activations around snow, not around any feature that actually distinguishes a wolf and a husky. Now, one bonus idea that I think is really interesting when it comes to convolutional neural nets is the idea of occlusion. Occlusion basically means we're going to take a portion of an image and either cover it up or delete it and see if that impacts the ability of the model to make an accurate prediction. For instance, here we have an image of an elephant. And when we occlude something in the image that we as humans know is not that important, we can see that reflected in the fact that the model is still pretty confident that this is an elephant. However, when we occlude something that's a lot more important, like most of the face of the elephant, we can see that that reduces the confidence of the model that this is indeed an elephant. Thus, occlusion can help us learn what the model is using in order to make its prediction. Another interesting bonus idea when it comes to ComNets is the idea of adversarial examples. Adversarial examples basically mean we are tricking a convolutional neural network into making a wildly different prediction, even though the image that we're using to trick it to our eye looks exactly the same as the original. For instance, here we can see this image of a panda, and when we feed it unaltered through the model, it does indeed make the prediction of it being a panda. However, we can use gradients to learn a very subtle and small pattern of noise that we can then add to our image to then create an image that to the human eye looks exactly the same, but to the model looks like a totally different thing. In fact, this model thinks that this image is a monkey. This idea is interesting on its own, and it gives us some insight into how convolutional neural networks work, but it can also be used to train the model. If we train it using these adversarial examples, we can make it more robust to those adversarial examples. Okay, enough bonus content. So far, all of the models that we've talked about are pretty much doing one thing image classification. This is taking an image and classifying it as a panda or not a panda, or is it a monkey, a human, or a car? However, that's not the only type of vision task we might want to do with a convolutional neural net. Another task we might want to do is image segmentation. Image segmentation takes an image and basically returns pixel by pixel what category each of the pixels in our image belongs to. For instance, on the left here, you can see that we're trying to find which pixels are part of a cat and which pixels are not part of a cat. If all we want is to know whether or not a given pixel is cat or not cat, we're doing semantic segmentation. This is where all of the cat pixels will be in one group and all of the non-cat pixels in another. However, we can also do something called instance segmentation. In instance segmentation, we not only want to know when a pixel is part of a cat, but also the individual cats that may be in the picture. When we do image segmentation, our model is going 
going to return something called a mask. This mask basically tells you for each pixel, is it cat or not cat? Is it object or background? Thus, you can see that interestingly, our output of the model is going to be the exact same size as the input because we want a pixel by pixel answer to whether or not this is a cat. But in all of the convolutional architectures we talked about previously, the size of our output, the features that we're learning, got smaller and smaller as we sent it deeper and deeper into that convolutional net. Thus, when we're doing things like image segmentation, where the output needs to be the same size as the input, we end up having this sort of U-shaped architecture. Like in a regular convolutional net that we learned for image classification, we're going to take our images and apply convolutional layers and then probably pooling layers with more convolutional layers and so on and so forth. This will allow us to learn some useful features from that image. But then of course, we have to to upscale those features in order to get an output that is the same size as our original image. In order to do that, we basically have to reverse the pooling and the convolutions that we did in the first half of the network. And there's two main ways to do that. First, there's upsampling. Upsampling is essentially the opposite of pooling. For each pixel in our image, all we do is take that pixel and repeat it multiple times to get a larger output. Now note, just like with pooling layers, there's no parameters to learn here. All we're doing is we're taking our input and we're upscaling it to create a larger output. So if upsampling is the opposite of pooling, then transpose convolutions are the opposite of a convolutional layer. In a typical convolution, we take a filter and we slide it across an image. You can see that happening in the animation on the left. In a transpose convolution, we're sort of trying to undo a convolution. In order to do that, our input is going to be a lot smaller than the filter we're applying to it. As you can see, we add extra padding around our input in order to be able to slide this larger filter across it. Thus, our output is going to be a lot larger than our input. Here's a static version of what transpose convolutions are doing. Again, just like in a regular convolution, we're learning a filter, but we're basically applying that filter to a smaller image and we add padding around that image so that when we slide our filter across, our output is a lot bigger than our input. On the left, you can see that we can add that padding completely around our input image and then slide our filter across, but we don't have to do it that way. We can also apply the padding in between the individual pixels of our input and then slide the filter over that. Thus, we're learning a convolution that basically allows us to get a bigger output from a smaller input, thus undoing a convolution. To review, upsampling undoes pooling. Like pooling, there's no parameters that it has to learn. Transpose convolutions basically undo convolutions and create a larger output from a smaller input. Like convolutional layers, there are parameters that we need to learn, the filter, when we do a transpose convolution. Both of these types of layers allow us to take all of the useful features we learned through our traditional convolutional structure of conv, pool, conv, pool, and upsample it so that we get an output for image segmentation that is the same size as our input. Another thing we might want to do when doing computer vision tasks with convolutional neural nets is object detection. Like image classification, we're trying to figure out what is in an image. But unlike image classification, we're not just classifying an image as is pizza isn't, we're actually trying to figure out where in the image these different objects are. The way we do that is by learning where a rectangle is that surrounds that individual object and what that object object contains. For instance, this rectangle contains a person, whereas this one contains a street lamp. One interesting thing to note is that when we're doing object detection, we not only care that an object is in an image, we also care where it is. And that was not the case in our typical image classification neural net. Thus, remember the fact that we used max pooling because we cared what was in an image, not where it was. But now we're in a situation where we do care where something is in an image. Therefore, when doing things like object detection, it's more common to use strides in order to downsample our image instead of max pooling. Remember, max pooling says, is there an object somewhere in this region? 
whereas strides will preserve the positional information in the image. The last thing we might want to do with convolutional architectures is cool things like neural inpainting. Neural inpainting basically takes images where different portions of the image might be missing, and it learns how to fill in that missing portion with something realistic. Now, these examples look a little bit silly, but imagine a really old picture that you have of your family that has a bunch of creases or spots that have developed over time. Neural inpainting could learn how to fix those photos so they look more natural and undamaged. Now, we've learned a lot about convolutional architectures, both the basic types of layers that we can use as well as some more advanced topics. However, it's hard to get enough data to train a really well-performing convolutional neural net. Often with these types of neural networks, you're going to use a pre-trained model. The pre-trained model will be trained on a huge data set of images, and the idea is that all of those convolutional layers learn some useful features that you could then apply to whatever problem it is that you're doing. What we do is we take all of those convolutional and pooling layers, which again are learning that hierarchical feature representation, and we take the features learned by them and then feed it into our own model that does whatever it is that we would like it to do. For instance, we could take the features learned by a pre-trained network and use it to classify images as cat or not cat. And there may come a time when you need to train your own custom convolutional network, but honestly, typically you're going to be using pre-trained networks that have been trained on huge huge repositories of images and have learned useful and very general features that you can use to apply to your problem all right that's all i have for you i will see you next time